Hi, I'm Guy Hendricks Dias. I'm the production designer of The Nutcracker in the Four Realms, and this is Notes on a Set. Ladies and gentlemen, my favorite part of Christmas, my favorite part of this evening, I present to you your gifts. So in this first scene, Drosselmeyer is making an introduction to his party guest, and we can see really a very glorious ballroom set. And basically, the space was, uh, was empty. For example, the names of the students were written on the, on the walls here. So you'll notice that each of these panels, there are these sort of beautiful paintings that have been added all the way down. All of these chandeliers, I think there's something like 10 of them in total, which were sourced by Lisa Chug, our wonderful set decorator. The window at the back actually looked out onto sort of uh, uh, modern London. And of course, our film is set in um, 1879, so we had to do something about that. So firstly, you're going to notice this very elaborate sort of drapery. I think we had something like 300 meters of red velvet. I mean, the scale of this space was something like 35 feet to the ceiling of this hall. Also, you'll notice this sort of frosting that we've added on the window at the back here. This really was to hide, as I say, looking out onto sort of modern London. You'll notice these little accents of red on either side of the door. This hall was primarily white. So to get that sort of festive feeling for the scene, we had to go ahead and paint this entire hall red before we did any of these other elements that I'm talking about. Now, I, I, I'm sort of wondering where to start here, because first of all, this was an incredible location that we found just outside of London. It had these gorgeous balconies for us all the way around. And it offered us this wonderful sort of promenade through these arches through here. So we knew we could light through those for a night scene where the children are coming out to this wonderful garden. Here's the really interesting thing. You see all those people in there. That's actually the, uh, just literally a tiny box. There's no door that goes into the hall behind them. So we had to cram something like 30 people into this tiny box and we built this box with fake doors that burst open for this shot where we see these kids just run out. Their objective, of course, is to come to this sort of central pagoda that's sitting here, which again is something that we constructed. And below it, you're just going to be able to make out all of these bits of colored thread or string, if you like, that all span out in the shape, of course, of a spider web. The idea being that each of the children will find their names at the end of these cords and then follow them off into the mansion and the various grounds, hopefully to find their present at the end. And this onion top is something that we'll see a great deal of later on um, in the architecture because we were inspired so much by Russian architecture and Eastern European architecture. But here you can see the children. These are the little tags that they're going to grab. All of these lanterns were really a requirement from the lighting department. You know, we really shot this at night. And although we, you know, have all this snow that you can see here and this sort of frosty feel, the other important point to make here is that this was shot in the middle of the summer. And so uh, all of the snow you're looking at is, is fake. And it was actually quite warm from what I remember. Obviously, the maze was something that we constructed as well. When we first came to this location, literally this courtyard here, was just a plain open pebble stone courtyard. There wasn't even any grass. So we had to lay down um, you know, our own grass and then construct this rather sort of flamboyant maze that you're looking at here. So this is actually a set, and although you don't see it because of the mysterious lighting that we've got going on here, it's basically a sort of a rectangle. This is the shape of the room. It has an arched ceiling uh, with these sort of uh, beautiful Jacobean uh, tiles. You're going to sort of see that detail coming through here, and that runs all the way around the room. And so much of what we do in the art department is often not seen, and it works beautifully in the dark as well. But the most important feature about this room and most interesting is this wallpaper. You're going to notice this uh, motif of owls transitioning as you go down into mice.
all of this really was done with, with uh, smoke and mirrors and trickery. This enormous tree, and you can see very clearly, this is the other side of, of the, uh, the exit, uprooted itself uh, as it was sort of rotting. And of course, Clara continues on her journey in this direction. But all of these trees, as far as you can see, were all sort of flocked. Um, again, the film was shot in the summer. But right back here, these trees that you can see back here are actually painted on a backing. So one of the things that was interesting is Lasse Holstrom wanted a very traditional feel to this film. We uh, used a lot of painted backings in this film rather than um, relying on a green screen and visual effects. This really was the image that I was looking for uh, when I was sketching. You're looking at several layers of information here. Obviously we have this sort of stream which runs through here. We have the fallen tree, uh, which really was a, an exciting thing to design. Here we have this first layer of trees, and these were all real, they were bought in, we, we had them all sort of flocked. I think we end, ended up using a sort of um, an industrial insulator or something to, to actually get this uh, thick uh, laden snow, and then in turn that was all painted. Now behind these trees, to create something we call foreshortening, we have smaller trees which give you a sense of distance, you can see them back there, and then this sky and these treetops that you see here are actually all the painted trees. So really you're dealing with uh, one, two, three, four different layers of information just to create the shot of Clara coming out of this fallen tree. The tree itself was uh, incredibly complicated to just get on the stage and really it started its life as blocks of white foam. So we started by sticking, I think, two dozen of these blocks together in length and height to create this very strange sort of cubist white sculpture. And from that, uh, that point, we put two or three artists, uh, sculpting artists, onto this giant block and they began the process of slowly creating the shape you're looking at here. Once the, uh, the sculpture was completed, of course, it was too big to get through the doors of the sculpture shop. So we actually then had to cut it. We use a hot wire, which is rather like a cheese wire, and we cut the tree along its length into many sections, and then had to re-glue it again in order to then begin the process of painting. So just there with that one piece of, of set, um, you're already talking about, uh, you know, probably 20 to 25 people just involved in that one element that will be on the screen for approximately five seconds. It's, it's quite horrific when you think about it. This performance describes the creation of the Four Realms. And from a design standpoint, of course, it's incredibly interesting. So we had these enormous chandeliers uh, brought in by uh, Lisa Chug, our wonderful set decorator. Now these cables that you're looking at here are because all of this scenery, all actually raised like a Victorian greeting card. So all of these layers of this set, I'm just gonna draw, there was one layer I think that was there, the next layer was here, and then there was a third layer. Also, all of these sort of fan-like structures that look like water on either side, they all opened up. And uh, these waves, these stylized waves that you see to the left and the right, are all controlled by a stagehand who is off to the left and the right. And by working a couple of control panels, those waves actually moved back and forth, which was quite nice. The ballet tells the story of the four realms, how your mother discovered our world. Quite a lot of thought was given to these, these very bizarre thrones. You'll notice here behind Kira, they're actually set into a large piece of resin. You have these swan heads. You'll see them better actually behind Clara. There's one there and one there. They meet in the middle. And actually right behind Clara in this space here is a large piece of sort of resin, which is a sort of a transparent plastic. And we were able to set into it for each of the regents something that related to their part of the world. And all of this detail was there to sort of grow the culture of um, the Nutcracker and the Four Realms. It just helps make things, I think, feel very real and established.
this is a, a, a sort of a painted backing all the way through here. We had some wonderful scenic painters, traditional scenic painters in the UK, spend literally two weeks creating this enormous night sky all the way around the stage. These uh, little windmills, of course, all work. We had three of them, one, two, three. These trees, these rather strange, almost Dr. Seuss-like trees, all grew, and so all the trees actually come up and open up. Likewise, these origami flowers that you see, they all opened up. But I think um, largely for the sake of the dancers, most of these things needed to be real. Again, a lot of interesting details here. Uh, all of these steps are all uplit, which is a gorgeous detail, really, because it, it allows all of their dresses to glow from the bottom. So you get this wonderful sort of blend up. We've already talked about this backdrop, but one of the things you're going to notice if you look carefully is that there are lots and lots of stars that twinkle throughout this sky. All of those were literally little bottle tops that were stuck or, or pinned, I should say, by hand onto this painted psyche. And then somewhere back here, behind all these layers of scenery that you're looking at, Chris Corbould and his amazing special effects team had people pointing fans so that they would sort of move and twinkle in, in, the, uh, in the light. So although they may look like they've been added in CGI, they're actually uh, really there. It was really interesting with this film. We, we had designed everything so well, and I think because we were very preoccupied with the story, very preoccupied with, you know, figuring out what we were going to do for the Nutcracker, there was always this sort of slug line in the script, which, is, which was ballet performance. And all of us kept sort of putting it off and going, oh yeah, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. And then of course the reality was that we were gonna shoot this thing in a month. And sometimes when you have those time constraints, I think some of the best ideas come to light. And one of those little ideas that's worth talking about here are all these little dots that you see. Now, this is something different to the, uh, the stars that I mentioned earlier. These are huge curtains of pearls that all come down, all drop down to simulate a sort of a stage version of a snowfall, I suppose. Behind every piece of scenery that you're looking at, we actually had costumed actors and extras working the various gears, pulling on ropes. And here you see the back of the ship, and it's rather comical. You sort of see someone uh, turning a wheel, which is presumably driving the ship across the stage. You see someone fanning the flames here. You see someone throwing out uh, uh, bits of snow as though the ship's breaking through ice. So all of these guys back here added to that sort of texture and the reality of this being a real stage performance. It's a three-dimensional immersive experience. And the land of sweets. This was an absolutely nutty part of the set to put together. It was really crazy. It said, what do you do to show the land of sweets? This started as a sketch that I did. It was really tongue in cheek. I had these, as you can see, these sort of gingerbread men here who are all sort of linking arms. Uh, the idea being that they would be on this sort of uh, sort of lazy Susan or carousel set within them are these sort of uh, lollipops and we have candy canes and then the central piece of course is this absolutely bizarre uh, ice cream and of course this kind of ice cream which is an iconic image for us in, in sort of the modern day if I'm honest really did not exist at this period of time but you just couldn't show or represent the land of sweets without having this sort of wonderful you know ice cream top so I I uh, took artist license with that one, so please forgive me, any purists. You can see here that the stars or these bottle tops are really showing themselves very clearly in this particular scene. The audience was set back here. This is the entryway that Clara uses to come in and progress over to this sort of central stage here. We love the idea of putting the important members of the audience right in the center of the stage. We really jumped in and created a, a, a tiny uh, fairground. You can see here we got sort of a Ferris wheel 
uh, with these balloons that all light up. So that was a, a, a you know, an interesting little uh, construction to deal with. And again, that's being turned by someone off camera in costume, turning a little wheel where a chain is running that. Over on the other side, we have a sort of a merry-go-round with this rather sort of frantic uh, cockerel on top and uh, numerous birds in transit around that, that spin around. And this centerpiece, a lot of people ask me, what, what's the significance of these elephants? Well, really, it's a propaganda piece. This is a performance that has been put together for Clara to explain the four realms. So rather than showing it as an inviting place, they've decided to show the main entry as this rather sort of beastly, scary palace, if you like, that you wouldn't want to enter. You wouldn't want to go to this place at all. This is your mother's throne, Your Grace. The elements that you're looking at have all been pretty carefully considered so that there's a lot of symbolism within all of these sets. The motif, if you like, of, of, the, uh, of the peacock, you'll see on either side of this throne here, we have these wonderful sort of peacocks that sort of hold this throne up. Peacocks traditionally are a sign of, of good luck and goodwill um, in various cultures around the world. Then for the back of the throne, we have these very elegant wings, which are designed to actually frame Clara when she's looking back at the other performers. You're going to notice that the wall tiles here, are these diamond shaped wall tiles, if you look really closely, each one of them, they again symbolize the, the four realms themselves. The window, behind the throne is keyhole shaped, which of course is another one of those interesting details reminding us all the time that the big mystery behind this film is largely about this music box and the lost keys. All of the colors and the, and the, uh, the materials that we used within this set were kept quite muted and quite, uh, quite restrained compared to the exterior of the palace, which is sort of vivid red and almost looks like a giant piece of candy itself. We barely escaped Mother Ginger and the Mouse King. Oh, you met Mother Ginger? Oh, my dear Clara, you're lucky to be alive. You can see here that there's great symbolism. They see Clara as someone who's come to save them. So for me, there was this wonderful opportunity to create this image of an angel, which is really what you're looking at here. One of those uh, winks or nudges to the audience to look just a little bit closer behind the meaning behind the visuals that they're looking at. And again here, you can just sort of make out off to the side here. This, this symbolizes our humbug candy again. We have our icicle. All of these symbols really help you uh, realize that you're in a kingdom that's, that's grown from a culture of these different lands coming together to create this palace. When it comes to designing uh, a world like this, you have to be careful about creating imagery that's, uh, that hopes to be completely original. So for example, with this uh, throne that we're looking at, the wings are uh, obviously completely imagined uh, from a sketch. The peacocks that you see on either side, I think they were from a balcony or something in, in, in Prague. We saw some carved uh, peacocks and decided, oh, they would be a really nice sort of, you know, a design motif for this throne. The throne itself, it took about uh, five weeks to make. We had about uh, four or five people working on it. Again, it was sculpted by hand and painted meticulously. I think there are about eight layers of paint alone just on that throne to, to give it that sort of authentic metallic feel. But really, the, the craftsmanship and the work that went into uh, this film is, is uh, really exceptional. And this Throne is a prime example of that work. So the Nutcracker was a, a a project that took approximately a year to to design and and uh, rehearse and film and there was a great deal of responsibility in creating the world of the Nutcracker because it was one of the things that Walt Disney himself had always wanted to make a live action film about this bizarre story that we know primarily through going to see it at, at, at ballets and their gorgeous music. So we were sort of really out there <laughs> trying to, uh, to dream up this world from scratch. This is one of those rare occasions where I was just absolutely glued to the set. There really isn't anything else to say except a uh, huge thanks to the incredible crew and that we had uh, working on this film, both sides of, of the pond really. 
um, to bring the Nutcracker to life. Thank you. <laughs>